Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say, starting off, uh, what a great event. And it's been phenomenal listening to so many amazing people. And realizing that you guys are like, how are you people like fucking having children and doing all this amazing shit? It's amazing. <laughs> but perhaps I answered my own question, huh? Eh? Um, so yes, as Bindi mentioned, we work together at Skyrocket Digital, where yes, I shower abuses on Bindi, and her tears do give me strength. Um, and I wanted to talk today about communicating uh, your purpose and what that means. And it starts from a bit of a personal place for me, because um, when I think about purpose and what that means for an organization, uh, it really begins with the individual. So those of you that are familiar with Marshall Ganz's work, you'll uh, be familiar with this sort of storytelling model where he talks about how to tell your public story. And when you're telling a powerful public story, it always starts with a profound understanding and sense of self. It's a vulnerability, it's opening up to your audience, and it's presenting on yourself first and foremost uh, and letting them in before you move out from that space and start telling the story of us and how we're together and what brings us together. Ultimately arriving at the story of now. And that's typically the call to action, that's the statement, that's the powerful moment that moves your audience forward once you've created this connection. When we're working in a corporate setting, um, quite often we're talking about language in terms of product market fit. Uh, you know, lately we've gotten a little bit smarter about this, we've introduced the notion of emotion. So it's not just product market fit, it's product market and the emotional connection you create with that market through, through your brand. But so often when it comes time to actually start constructing the language, to start telling these stories and trying to that, uh, create that connection with your audience, um, the mechanics of it wind up looking more like this, where we're all doing the conversion optimization, we're all doing the testing. I, I'm going to come full circle, Robin. No, uh, I'm, not, I'm not forwarding what you said earlier. Uh, but we start using language as this carrot, and we start thinking of our audience in terms of this like, stubborn animal that we're just trying to get them to move forward. And what do we need to dangle in front of them to, to get them to move forward? And that's been you know, the role of advertising for a long time as well. It's been, you, know, you, you put out some advertising, you try to create the messages, the pairing of, of message to imagery, the semiotics of that to create some action in your audience. But this is a bit of a cynical approach. And this is an approach that assumes that you know, really this is just a carrot and your audience truly is just this, this stubborn animal. And what can we do to kind of move beyond this? And why should we move beyond this? And one of the reasons why we encourage um, a lot of people, our clients especially, to move beyond this is that when you're advertising, when you're just trying to dangle a carrot and kind of put your commodity out there, you're really just positioning yourself, your product, your service as that commodity. You're as good as the language that you're using. But what can we do that's more powerful than that? What can we do that's going to actually help you create a momentum uh, with your audiences? And so we started thinking about what that means to an organization, right? Of how do you actually create this momentum? How do you create this emotional connection with your audience? And how do you even do that internally as an organization? So we started thinking about the language we use in an organization and what we sort of gravitate towards. Um, you know, religion's a bit of a, a, a dirty word these days, but it's interesting that, you know, the people that we herald as the best leaders, whether it's in corporate government or government spaces, are actually kind of the cultish ones, right? It's like the, the you know, the, the Steve Jobs legend and, and, you know, for anybody that's a fan of Apple or, you know, even Steve Bezos to some extent. Um, it's these people that become these almost cultish figures because of the vision and the belief system that they espouse that people start connecting with over time. And you realize that actually, you know, these corporate entities, sometimes we too often think of them as, you know, ones and zeros, as numbers, as mathematics, as things that aren't actually organisms. But the realization is that any time you put a bunch of people together who are organisms, uh, you actually just wind up with a collective organism. So what would branding, what would communicating your purpose look like if we actually thought of it in terms of an organism? And if you're thinking of it in terms of an organism, you're back to thinking of it in terms of self. So these days when we talk about branding, we actually talk about branding as a spiritual exercise but the difference being that it's a spiritual exercise for this corporate self. It's a spiritual exercise that leads you to this profound sense of self-awareness where you connect with what you're actually starting with, which is the people, the team that you put together. 
And sometimes when we're talking to clients, you know, they'll say to us, well, you know, we came to you guys for brand strategy. We don't want to be who we are. We want to be better than that. We want to be something else. And they almost feel like there's a constraint or limitation in connecting with this profound sense of self. And what we actually have to tell them and, and frankly take them through the process and show them is that it's only when you connect with that profound sense of self, it's only when you connect with what you're starting with that vision, those values, those things that you've had with you since you were a child that are never going to change till the day you die. They just won't. It's the makeup of who you are. That it's only when you connect with those things that you can actually draw a line and a path to where you want to be. So the encouragement we give, um, you know, not just, not just our clients, but uh, frankly, anybody we work with, is that at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create an alignment, not just between the product or the service that you're putting into the market and, and, the, and the clients you're trying to sell it to, but things become profound when you can draw a through line from the most junior people in your company and the vision and the values that they themselves are espousing all the way through to your most valuable customer. Because now, when you get into a pattern, like Robin said, of testing and putting the, you know, the marketing muscle behind the work that you're doing, the momentum and the effects of that are so much more profound than simply dangling the carrot. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, there's a question way at the back there. Do you need a mic? So cost benefits an interesting question um, because most of what I'm talking about right now um, isn't necessarily tied to cost benefit. Um, it shows up, but it's not that measurable. Somebody earlier talked about the intangibles. So there are some opportunities to actually measure you know, what we've always called intangibles or what large corporations will kind of put on their balance sheets as like a $100 million line item, I think is like, Brand, I think, is like a $100 million line item for you know, one line of Coke's products or something. Um, but when it comes to your brand's perception of where you start and perhaps you do some of this work of changing the language and how the connection with your audience uh, changes over time, there is an opportunity to measure that change in perception over time. But the cost benefit is really you know, between what you're sort of starting with. It goes back to that self-awareness thing of what are you starting with, why are you in business, and then who's valuable to you that you want to connect with. So, it's actually kind of, um, I think, the antithesis of what you're talking about. It isn't about saying, you know, who's our most loyal customer and let's, let's chase them. It's about saying, you know, what's the most profound thing that you're doing and what's, what's actually the major motivator for you to be doing what you're doing, right? If, you, if it's a company that you started or if it's an organization that you're really proud of, um, why are you in business? And then who is out there that's actually going to value you uh, for the reasons that, you know, you already exist for as opposed to you chasing somebody because A, either they're loyal or B, they have a lot of money. I have a question. So before this all started, uh, just to give a little bit of context, so my last company that I exited out of was a digital agency. So Mo and I were talking about the <laughs> war scars that we get uh, being in that, uh, that field. And uh, personally, I was in it for like 14 years. So. I have the scars to show for it. So is there something that you could use as a lesson right now in terms of what you've seen in the landscape in terms of changes? Like at one point, like we joked about, um, WordPress came in and became like a boon and a pain in the ass. Is there, is there something now that you would say is maybe equivalent or something that people should be aware of when it comes to branding or voice or uh, you know, reinventing themselves, something that's good and maybe something you've seen that is not so good, um, or even a, an examples if you haven't. For sure. Um, 
I would say that you know, measurement, data, conversion optimization, these things are always going to be important. Um, and they should be fundamental to your marketing strategy and your communications. But what you want to do is you want to create a story that transcends the commodity space. right? And especially in the startup realm, we still so often have companies that are like, they're, they're killing it, right? But they're, they're, they're doing all of their work in the commodity space of defining their commodity so well, of pricing it so perfectly, of explaining the features very, very well, that they're doing very little to actually transcend that connection and create some sort of emotional connection and some, you know, frankly, through that loyalty with, with the product or service that they're putting forward. So there's a couple of approaches here. It's like either you're going into a space that was never serviced before and you're providing a product or service for the first time, right? And in that instance, I mean, frankly speaking, I'd love to have clients, we're a branding agency, but you kind of don't need a brand, right? Because you're providing value where none existed before. Or you're going into a space, and I was just talking with somebody earlier, where actually that space has been over-serviced. And when the space is over-serviced, how do you disrupt that? It's through experience and through this emotional connection. So depending on what stage you're at and, and where you're at, um, I think that kind of you know, dictates what your priorities should be. But even if you're going to a space where no value has existed like what you're providing, um, things move quickly, and it might just be a matter of time before you have some competitors in that space, especially once you've validated the fact that there's value in that space. So you might start off in that, in that you know, product or service commodity sort of battle, but you should be very quickly thinking about um, coming up with some transcendent connection with your audience. Any other questions out there? I have one, but I'll give it to the audience before. Neil, did you have a question? This is, yeah, just slam them, like, just. Why did you charge them? <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. Um, but um, you applied some of that thinking to Kabuni in creating our brand. So um, walk, you know, walk us through how you came to that and created the brand that we've got. Sure. I wish I had a visual aid here, but uh, we don't. So I'll just, I'll just point at Neil. I'm not sure what that means. Um, so when Neil came to us, it was this company called Whole New Home. And it was in the e-commerce space. And sure, you can sell product, you can sell furniture. There's a lot of ways of making some sort of uh, you know, e-commerce business a go online. But it was pretty firmly fixed in, the, in a commodity space. And you know, Neil had some aspirations, and he had some thoughts around what he wanted to do for community and what he wanted to do in the world and kind of leave a positive impact, some legacy. And that was sitting off to the side in this foundation called Better Homes for Everyone. And the realization we had as a branding agency was that you know, actually... You've taken this massively transformative purpose that your company has, and it's like you've cut the heart out of the body and you kind of placed it in a box over here, and now you're kind of like going through life like a robot. So we said, what if we took that heart and we actually placed it back into the center of the business? And we told a story that is quite sincere and beautiful about how we want to actually give everybody a better sense of home. Uh, both. Just at that like, amazing moment. Um, so, you know, how do we actually create this profound connection by, um, you know, creating a better sense of home for everybody, both the clients that are connecting with the design community, but also through the shelters and the programs that are helping uh, the people that are homeless or otherwise marginalized in our communities. And it wasn't until we told that holistic story that we created a beautiful brand story that is very difficult to compete with, right? Because a lot of people can say they're selling furniture online, a lot of people can say they're selling you know, interior design services online, or that they've got an app that's got some 3D thing in it. Um, but who can actually come out and say that we're trying to create better homes for everyone? So my question is, um, I don't know if you can truly answer that without working with a particular company, but do you have something that's like a good place to start at the very least? And I know you, I heard you say brand story, but you know, how, do you, how do you come up with that sitting in a room all working late at night? Um, so, a couple of things, actually. I love uh, being called a brand expert um, because I, I debunk that. Um, like, the brand expert and that agency world, like, I think gave people like me and in my role a bad name. There are no experts. That's all bullshit. So, if there are no experts, then what do you do? And it's about asking a couple of key questions, right? In fact, um, you know, what we're, what we're always telling startups to do is, you know, think in terms of minimum viable brand, right? Of, you know, what's your purpose? Who's your audience, right? And what's the emotional connection you want to create with these people, right? And if that's all you start with, it's about making those decisions early on. And that's it. It's just about thinking about it early on because what happens in the startup realm 
And Vancouver's actually not bad at this. San Francisco's fucking horrible. There's such a DIY culture there around technology that everybody's like, oh no, I'm, we're not worried about brands. You know, we're, we're in R&D, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, I'm installing WordPress on the weekend. And this is you know, a conversation with like a biotech firm, right? And they're like drinking their own Kool-Aid so hard and they've got this legend created around the San Francisco startup that there's literally no focus on design thinking. And, what, and, and the very small thing that we try to do with startups is get them thinking about design and get them thinking about communications early, and that's it, right? Not, not sell some six-figure you know, contract to you know, do it, because that makes no sense for a startup to sign up for that. But what happens is that as soon as um, you know, any startup is starting to get some traction, starting to move a little bit, and you know, the founders think, okay, we're you know, adulting pretty hard, we're, we're, we're a serious startup here, um, there's a, a relationship started with an accounting firm, another one with a law firm to protect your IP and everything else, and that's it. And all we say to startups is at that point, think about design counsel as being like the third prong. And just start thinking about your audience and start thinking about what the message that audience is gonna be and how you're gonna start generating that emotional connection. And that is it. Everything else is gonna come with time, right? Every, every startup founder, I believe, that begins life this way will be their own brand expert over time, right? You'll identify the type of connection that you wanna create with your audience and how you want that to be represented, both verbally and visually. You just have to start it a little bit earlier and then iterate.